I met him in a grocery store. He was buying groceries. Welcome to a new edition of the Neon Jazz Interview Series with veteran jazz singer Vanessa Rubin. She opened up about her stellar 2019 CD, Vanessa Rubin Sings Tad Dameron. She is revered as both a torchbearer and a storyteller. This Cleveland native brings a wealth of diverse influences to her vocal performance from both the Trinidadian and Caribbean roots of her mother and traditional jazz by way of her Louisiana-born father. Her journey to becoming a jazz singer could be said to have begun at a very early age when she was characterized by her mother as always a very vocal child. And Vanessa knew that something was going to happen and she was going to be in the business. She has great stories, great insights, so get to know her and dig this interview, my friends. Thank you for taking a minute out for Neon Jazz today. I appreciate it. Ah, oh, man. It's more than my pleasure. So let's take a minute and talk about your latest 2019 album, where you sing Tad Dameron. Talk to me about this project. How did this come about? This project has... I've been walking with this project for a lot of years. You know, I'm from Cleveland. Tad is from Cleveland. And uh, when I first started out uh, singing, I was attracted to Tad's music because I really love beautiful ballads, and he has a unique quality of writing really beautiful melodies. And over the years, you know, I began to add more and more of his tunes to my repertoire. I think it was around the time, well, I always wondered why people didn't sing more Dameron. I knew, I knew there were Dameron, like Dameronia, groups like that that did a lot of his instrumental music, but I really didn't hear like a push on his instrumental stuff, right? I mean, vocal stuff. Of course, everybody knows the signature piece that Sarah Vaughan recorded, if you can see me now, but there were other things that I came to know about because, you know, I took some time to go and research and, you know, dig out a few really nice numbers that I thought people would really like. But in any case, I think it was the time uh, after Carmen McRae did the Monk vocal record and that how that record just opened up his music to a whole nother audience because you could now sing it, right? And I said, wow, that's a great idea. I would love to do, even though Ted's writing is nothing like Monk's, much more traditional, you know, and singable. <laughs> um, and I thought, well, I would like to do that same idea for Dameron. So I'm going to put together a collection of things. And it took me some time to get the collection together after researching and, and so forth. And then, of course, I wanted to uh, get some cats that, you know, was close to the source, so to speak. Guys that knew Tad, guys that studied his arranging, who really valued what he brought to the table in terms of his contribution during the 40s and the 50s, because we know Tad has such a deep influence on people like Miles and Dizzy and worked with singers, you know, like Billy Paul and Sarah Vaughn and Carmen McRae and, and you know, wrote a lot for those uh, big bands, in Kansas City because he really didn't like being like an out front kind of person, a soloist. He really loved arranging. And I really love to listen to great arrangements, right? Yeah, because as a soloist, you know, that's why everybody really loved Tad because he made, he created such great musical beds for soloists to play upon and singers to sing upon, right? And so that's that whole man behind the scene kind of like concept that I love because a lot of times we don't, you know, we fall in love with the soloist, but we don't think about who might have done the arrangement upon which we're falling in love with because the soloist is singing so beautiful on top of it. But would it be the same without that arrangement, right? Yeah. So, uh, you know, cast that I knew in New York, they were my teachers, mentors, cast that I knew like uh, Frank Foster and Benny Golson. Benny Golson, of course, who knew Tad, worked with him, traveled with him, wrote the foreword in two of his, you know, the books, the two only books on Tad's life and music. Uh, Frank Foster, who was one of our greatest arrangers in jazz, you know, um, got some of his ideas up for arranging from the way Tad came about before him arranging, you know. And things like that. And then Bobby Watson, who I absolutely love, who was the youngest of the group that I commissioned to do the project, 
did one for me too. Willie Faith Smith, who um, is from Cleveland, knew Ted, knew his family. You know, I just felt like I wanted to be close to the source, people that knew him, you know, and liked his writing and uh, really was uh, really very um, interested in actually doing it themselves because they loved him as much. So um, around 2003, 2004, I started working on commissioning the arrangements. I think I debuted it the first time in 2007, maybe, at the Kennedy Center, and I did it for a week at Dizzy's in 2007, I think, during the Christmas season, but I hadn't recorded it. All I had was the live uh, version of it, um, you know, just the music written, and uh, I decided to start shopping the idea around, and it was really funny because, you know, Ted does not enjoy the popularity of Ella, of Monk, of Miles. And when you do projects for people like that, it's easy for people to kind of get on board because everybody was celebrating centennials, right? Well, when Taz Centennial came up in 2017, I thought that would be enough for people to want to do something. But it was kind of like a hard sell because to to begin, I guess, to make Tad popular, you really kind of have to do a PR campaign on him, his life, his music, his story. You know, purists, jazz purists know about him, know uh, what a great contribution, you know, uh, he he made uh, in that transition between swing and bebop and his story. But I think more the latter people don't. Uh, all that said, after I really couldn't get interest, I said, I'm just going to do it myself. That's what I did. So I took my guys in the studio and we recorded and... Uh, you know, I did all the things that, ooh, RCA used to do for me back in the day. <laughs> what a, an ambitious endeavor. What a, la a wonderful labor of love. Uh, I'm very proud of it. It's the first one on my label, Niba Records, and uh, it's the first record of its kind. And uh, I don't think, you know, my intent was not to recreate the wheel. It was really just to bring Tad's story and his music more out to the forefront, put more light on him, uh, you know, expand the vocal library for singers, you know, encourage people to sing more down the line. There are other songs that I did not include in this uh, record that's out. Um, but um, I think this was a good beginning. I have just scratched the surface. And I just hope more people will get on board and talk about Ted like they talk about Ella and like they talk about, you know, Miles. You know how we all like to drop those first names like yeah. we all know who we're talking about. So yeah. when they say Miles and they say Monk and they say, you know, Sarah, I want them to say Ted in that same way. And so that's kind of the gist of it. So you grew up in Cleveland. You were a very vocal child from your bio. And I want to know this. Did you always know that singing and music was going to be a part of your life? Well, singing was always a part of my life and music, but I did not anticipate being a, a you know, a performer, much less jazz. I, uh, my parents were pushing academia. Uh, I went to college. I graduated in, uh, with a degree in journalism. I was supposed to go to law school, you know, all of that, because my parents were into that. And I came home from college and said, mm, I'm in love with jazz and I want to be a jazz singer. You can imagine how that went over. My mother was very happy and very supportive in my achievements. I worked very hard, and I love this music with all my heart. It is my passion. I feel very blessed to be able to make a living at something that is my passion because I know a lot of people, you know, aren't able to do that. You know, they can't paint or sculpt or be a dancer necessarily, but I've sacrificed a lot in order to do it. I'm a long-distance runner. I realize being in jazz does not mean, you know, uh, overnight success. You really don't get good at this stuff unless you do it a long time. Then you learn what to do as well as what not to do. So we're all kind of finding our way, you know, when, when we start trying to discover our own voices. I'm still trying to do that as well more and more. And I think... Um, uh, doing things that are a little unusual or first-time projects 
uh, challenge you and help you define your voice. And I'm still trying to do that. So I hope people enjoy it. And um, there's a lot to listen to, a lot to appreciate on that record. Do you feel at home on the stage? Is that like a second home for you? Do you ever still get nerves when you get on stage? Oh, I have the worst performance anxiety. Yeah. I do feel at home on stage, especially when I'm working with some cats that I really groove with, where we, you know, the chemistry is really great and everybody's doing the right thing at the right time, at the same time. Uh, I do love performing because I love being with people. When I'm giving love and they're giving me back love, it's just like the best situation you ever want to be in. Um, it just resonates. Uh, I feel like I'm in the right place, uh, which is why I decided to pursue singing jazz because I had one of my most important aha moments performing just because I always did sing like in school and so forth. But when I, but you know, when you mature and you have one of those aha moments where you just know this is what you want to do, this is what you should be doing. It's like a calling, so to speak. Nobody said it was going to be easy, but once I realized that that was uh, all my bells and whistles and lights went on, um, I just got about my business of, you know, figuring out how to do it. There was no road map. You know, there were a lot of stories and, you know, a lot of things. But, you know, my road is my road. I I could never do it the way everybody else does. You know, everybody's journey in life is different. You know, the one thing that I always find endearing about Cleveland, I've never been there. Of all the cities that I've been to, and I've been to a lot in this country, I always feel like there's this resounding grit and soul that comes out of a town like Cleveland, and it reminds me a little bit of Kansas City. Even though we're one of the original cradles, we're still a a springboard, so to speak. So my question to you is this. You obviously went to New York after Cleveland. Did Cleveland lay down a really solid framework for you to to have a career in jazz? Oh, definitely, because I started here. You know, um, when I decided I wanted to sing, I came back home after school, and I started, like, Everyone else, you know, I, uh, networking and going around sitting in, you know, and 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 working with a lot of the local musicians and some of them guys were like terrific, you know. They had been to New York and back. They had toured with some people, uh, but as they had gotten older and their families were here, you know, they came back home and they played around the scene. And, and uh, you know, some people don't want to live in New York all the time. So we had people like Neil Creaky who moved back to Cleveland, and he was accessible to me here. And I uh, had a great bass player I used to work with um, here, uh, Mr. Chink Stevenson. And Eddie Backus, very well-known blind organ player that lives here, he's still here playing. And I honed, my, you know, my teeth early with him. But my love was a, an organ group that I, you talk about grit, okay, was an organ group that I had here. That's when I first started out really singing with uh, the Blackshaw Brothers with Cecil Rucker on Vibes, who still plays around Cleveland. My nephew was playing guitar. He eventually went out into the R&B world. But we had one of the baddest organ groups out here in Cleveland at the time. We worked eight days a week. When I got ready to leave Cleveland, I wanted to take that group with me, but, you know, I couldn't get everybody to want to leave at the same time. But that Midwest thing is very deep, and I am living part-time back in Ohio, I'm, you know, between Brooklyn and Cleveland, and um, that same kind of grit launch board type environment is still here. Not, uh, it, you know, as, as big or as great as it was when I left because a lot of the venues are no longer open, but a lot of those, that same feeling, uh, that, you know, that Midwest type of thing is still here, uh, hence why um, Don Braden and I did a, a record a couple of years ago called 36, because Don Braden, who's a, who's a wonderful tenor saxophone player, as you know, and Flowers is also from the Midwest, he's from Kentucky, so we, we both came up, uh, in you know, on the organ circuit. So we said, man, we're going back to our roots. 
you know, this piano thing in New York is all slick and it's cool, but, you know, ain't nothing like a Hammond B3. And yeah. so I've been back to uh, working with organ as much as I can. I have a, a group. I tell you, being here in Cleveland those few years that I was working, because I only started singing around Cleveland for about three years, and then I left and went to New York because I had family there, and I always wanted to be in New York anyway. I felt the best of the best was there. But I had no idea Detroit was three hours away and had as a phenomenal music scene, not Motown, but jazz. I just didn't know the history of Detroit. So I'm back here in Cleveland now discovering how deep the roots in Detroit are, historical. And everybody that I knew in, in New York and, 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 you know, people we read about and everything, a lot of them were born in, the, in, in, in Detroit. Lived in Detroit, play. You know, you can. I can't look. The number Detroit, the number of musicians that come from that city is phenomenal. So yeah. I have a wonderful organ group that I work with out of there called my. I call them my Motor City Groove Collective, with Duncan McMillan on Hammond B three and Gaylen McKinney, who's the drummer from Straight Ahead, and um, and a and a and a guitar player that. You know, hey, who is just, hey, he's like West Montgomery reincarnated for me because that's his hero, and I love West Montgomery, uh, by the name of Perry Hughes, who still lives in Detroit, and, you know, he's out, you know, he worked with, um, uh, what's a guitar player from Detroit, acoustic guitar player. I loved him for many, many years. He was with him for 15 years, Earl Clues. And he plays with Bob James. And, you know, he told me, he said, shit, I never had to leave Detroit. I never needed to go to New York because everybody came to Detroit and everybody wanted, uh, you know, we had some killing house bands up here. And so I would say, yeah, I can understand that now because I still go to Detroit. And Detroit has a vibrant music scene even now. Don't let that, uh, that you know, that thing about, you know, with the factories leaving and jobs and, yeah, it, you know, it took a hit bad but you talk about a resilient re rebounding spirit grit oh baby so you know yeah. when i get on e down here in cleveland i just get in my car and drive three hours to detroit they ain't quitting up there yeah nice i think you just coined the name of an album that at one point while you were talking there and you said between brooklyn and cleveland it just has a nice ring to it <laughs> <laughs> So I'll keep that in mind, man. <laughs> I like it. I can I can just picture kind of a character like artistic rendering of downtown Cleveland and downtown like what Brooklyn would look like, and just little musical notes making a bridge. Man, yeah, because <laughs> like uh, what Brooklyn looks like now, Brooklyn looks like nothing compared to the Brooklyn that I moved into thirty years ago. Bro Brooklyn right. looks like a new little Manhattan. You know, it's funny. Uh, you know, I. I kind of rediscovered jazz. I got into broadcasting on the sports end of things and kind of got out of it because I just couldn't do it. There was just too much in the sports scene that was just like, I'm not spending my life doing this. Mm. I rediscovered my broadcasting roots with jazz, and I am just floored by not only how beautiful all of you jazz cats are and how humble and wise and rich and soulful you all are. Every time I talk to you and get to spin your music, but I also discovered, I lost my father 10 years ago. He was born in Brooklyn, raised Oh, there. man. And every time I hear all of this, it's almost like you all are verbally pulling me back to a home that I never discovered except through words, through my dad's voice. Oh, but man, there go. You just got to walk. You got to walk the pavement. We like yeah. that because when you're a creative person, you have to draw from somewhere. Yeah. You have to draw from the universe. Yep. You have to draw from the culture. Yeah, you, you draw from people and, and all of the stuff that the people put in you. And so when you hear the music, that's what it is. It's not something yeah. that is artificially created. This is not some stuff out of a test tube. Hence, it's raw. It's urgent. It ain't perfect, but it's perfect. You know what I mean? I hear you. I feel it. That's the truth, and that's the thing. Charlie Parker, because there's perfection and imperfection, if you want to call it that. Yeah. 
And it's all your voice, absolutely. And speaking of seasoned veteran voices, you've had the chance to learn from those like Faroa Sanders, Frank Foster, and the great Barry Harris. What have you learned from the legends and veterans over the years about how to be a musician? Oh, man, you know, you got to seek truth. You got to study. You got to do all of the formal stuff. But like Frank used to tell me, he said, you know, all reading and all of that, and, you know, he could read and write and everything. He was oh, very intelligent. He said, but feeling to him was more important than anything else. So, you know, I would watch him rehearse a band. And there's just a lot of things that is just not on the paper. And when he would talk about the music and how he felt the music should be interpreted, then you would get this human aspect of it that's not written. There's a lot of notation you can put on a piece of paper to give people guidance on how to play something. But there is nothing like the human condition when you mix that in. And yeah. so that's what makes the notes come up off the paper. That's what causes the magic. And so, you know, I think that's a lot of what they taught me. Some of the lessons, you know, that that they were teaching me at the time went way over my head because I just didn't know, realize what they were talking about at the time because I guess I hadn't really matured in the music. And one of the things is kind of getting out of your own way, you know, being a medium, you know, letting the stuff kind of come through you, trusting, trusting, you know, doing your homework. But after that, you ain't going on the stage thinking about all the homework. Now you're just going to relax and be musical and trust the people that are around you. You know, like I've had some days where I've crashed and burned, but that's all a part of the process. And I've learned to laugh at those moments in those moments. You know, getting naked, emotionally naked, and not worried about, because people just want honesty. They want truth. And they can tell when you're covering up. And so... I think early on, I was like a lot of people, young artists, you know, you want to be perfect for everybody. You want the jazz police to not, you know, can you and, and say and be critical and whatever. But after a while, you forget about all that. And you Absolutely. just go on and do, and you just go on and do what you do because we don't make, you know, I'm not dogging critics or anybody, but I told somebody just the other day, I don't, write music for critics. I don't sing for critics. I made this record because I love Tad and I want people to love Tad. And so whatever you hear or don't hear or whatever you think it should not be or should be, I don't care because there's a bigger purpose in all of this and it might not be realized till I'm dead and gone. I don't know. You know, they do stuff like that in music. You know, people be out here recording and killing themselves, you know, doing the best. And then as soon as they died, and all of a sudden, oh, wow, this person was the greatest and the greatest. Yeah, but you didn't do that when they were alive. You know what I'm saying? You know, you yeah. have to wait till somebody go to then go back and discover, oh, man, we slept that. Don't do no. that. No. Let let the music stand on its own. Listeners got two good ears on either side of their head. Let them decide if they like something or not. And I hope your listeners love it because, like I said, it was an ambitious endeavor. You know, I, I was sitting there at the board one day looking, you know, mixing help with the engineer, helping to mix the uh, parts with, you know, my co-producer, Cecil Bridgewater, who's a dear friend, too, one of our national walking treasures. I just kept sitting there looking down going, who the hell told me to go and record an octet? I love the arrangements. But, oh, my God, who the hell told me, am I going to be able to take the octet out on the road? I don't care whether they let me take it out. I'm recording it anyway because the music, you know, you're not going to get no more Frank Foster. That's it. He's gone. You're going to get what he already wrote. He's not going to do damn around for nobody else. And Jimmy Heath is still around in his 90s. Jimmy, he ain't going to do damn around for nobody else. 
I got in on the on 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 the end of some great shit, man. Benny Golson. He ain't gonna be writing no damn around for nobody anymore. He's just out yeah. playing and, 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 and we're all just enjoying him. You know? Yeah. So and and Willie Faye Smith, he's gone. So I mean, this is a very, very special project in its time. And the first <laughs> of its kind. And it might take some people to catch up on it. You know what I mean? For sure. Everybody has, has this level of education they achieve in their life, but one of the biggest moments is one of the first live jazz shows you ever see. What was one of the first ones you ever saw that moved you? Oh, wow. That's an unfair question. <laughs> because I saw some great live stuff here in Cleveland of local musicians. I met Greg Bandy here in Cleveland. That was one of the baddest drummers, only drummer who I ever met that played brushes like nobody I ever heard. Now, there were some cats here in Cleveland, Jack Town, you know, Raymond Ferris, who played brushes, you know, old school. But I didn't play with those guys. You know, I, you know they were kind of like not playing when I came along. But they were, but they were kind of at the end. And then I learned from Greg Bandy, who was from Cleveland, but was living in New York and playing with Farrell, playing with Betty. You know, he came with that New York, a uh, 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 on the off beat and the push up. I was like, oh, shoot. Who is that? And it just felt so different than anything I had worked with. And so I experienced some live, great, really live stuff here. The Willie Smith Big Band. Uh, the same guy, Willie Faye Smith, here. You know, I watched Neil Creaky and Chink do duos here for a number of times. When I went to New York, oh, and I saw the Heath Brothers for the first time in November or October of 1979. I didn't know who the Heath Brothers were, and Stanley Kyle was playing piano with them. And when I stood there in awe of that band. Jimmy, his brother, uh, t um, on bass. I don't think Tootie was playing drums. They had a Kiratana then. And Stanley Kyle, and that's when I was like, good God, who is that piano player? You know, I was hungry for New York when I got there, you know, and, and I just saw so much bad stuff. I saw Farrell Saunders down at the, at, uh, the Vanguard. Greg Bandy introduced me to him, and he let me get up and sing with him one song every night at the Vanguard. I wasn't on the gig, but I just I wanted to sing with him because I just that tenor saxophone. Oh my God! And I remember I used I would sing Easy Living every night with him. And at the end of the week, he gave me a hundred dollars. A man, you know, my broke self in them days. I was like, wow, that was like getting like, you know, he just gave me a little something for coming. But I should have been paying him, <laughs> you know. Yeah. And then I went to Rodney Dangerfield because I grew up on records in Cleveland, right? My parents didn't take me. I was too young to go to the clubs that were here at the time, I mean, Leo's Casino and stuff like that. That was a popular one. I was too young. And I had my last token, I think I had $10, because I heard Sarah Bob was going to be up at Rodney Dangerfield. And I was a Sarah... I mean, like, I couldn't listen to nobody else for, after look, getting hit to Sarah for a number of years. That was just the voice, and that was it. And I said, I'm going to see Sarah Vaughn, and I took my last token and my $10 and went to Rodney Dangerfields at night. It might have been more than 10 because I had to pay to get in. But I remember I, I didn't really drink then, and I remember ordering orange juice. I sat in the front row at this little table, and when she came out, I was in such awe because... You know, I had heard all these great Sarah records and heard, you know, all them acrobatic things that she could do with her voice. And now I was seeing it in the first, and I must have looked. She probably looked down at me and said, I know that got to be a little singer because I was sitting there with my mouth open the whole time. I don't even think I touched the orange juice because I remember looking down there and all the ice had melted and it was just water on top of the juice in the glass. <laughs> and I sat there all night listening to... That woman in person, and I had never seen or heard nothing like that. And that was one of my most memorable. And then I got hit to all of those guys. I would start to go see Joe Williams. I used to go see 
Billy Eckstein, one of my boyfriends, was a great bass player, Mr. Paul West. And through him, I got to walk in the dressing rooms of some of these people. I got to meet Carmen McRae and sit in the dressing room and talk with her and Billy Eckstein. And then I sat in the dressing room one night with Billy Eckstein and Sarah Vaughn. Whew, I just was just in the corner. I was just like, hey, hey, hey I'm just here. I ain't had nothing to say because all I wanted to do was listen and just be in their presence. Yeah. And, of course, you know, Nancy, you know, this was in the last 10, 15 years of their careers. And yeah. then I met Etta Jones. Oh, my God. Etta Jones and Irene Reed, who was in Harlem all the time. I was too busy being downtown instead of being uptown, checking out what was happening uptown in Harlem. And I got in with Ella, uh, not Ella, uh, Etta, the last, got to know her and become really good friends with her, maybe the last 10 or 15 years of her life. Love Etta Jones. And then she came and did those two recordings with me on that record I did called Girl Talk. And Irene Reed, oh, my God, who was a wonderful uh, blue, bluesy singer. I mean, she sung standards, but she's like a blues singer. And then she came, had a, a cold-blooded organ group with this cat, uh, Forrester, to get his first name. And she was killing. Because now I'm going, God, dog, this is what I left in Cleveland. You know, but all that was going on in town. The downtown was, you know, the piano trio. And when I said, I said, oh, I got to get with this piano trio stuff. And not that I didn't sing with any in Cleveland, but, you know, that big, fat, juicy piano, that organ, in other words. That I felt naked with a piano trio, you know? So that singing with an organ is like singing with a big band. And yeah. so, you know, those were, you know, and then I just got to meet cats and, you know, go and hear people like, you know, go down to Bradley's at night, you know, where we all used to go and hang out and go hear these great duos, you know, Kenny Barron with Ben Riley. And let me tell you, I went to Bradley's one and went there every night for a week to hear Larry Willis, Ben Riley, but they played monk the whole week. And I had never right really on. been into the monk music like that. But, you know, they were like authorities on monk. And I sat there. That's the week I fell in love with Ugly Beauty. How you like that? Yeah, I like it. I like oh, that. oh, so, I mean, and that was a place where anybody who was anybody in jazz, you could walk in there late, late at night, and they all be sitting there. You know, Betty might be in there. Clifford Jordan would be in there. You know, whoever was playing, there was some name. George Coleman would be sitting in there. You know, little young Roy Hargrove would be hanging out in there. You know, I was trying to hang out in there because we all just trying to be around the greatest thing there ever is for, as a jazz artist, you know. You want to be around the cat. You want to live vicariously through what they putting out, yeah. and hope that some of that stuff rub off on you. I love it. Yeah, yeah, so, man, it's it's a something. You've really opened a Pandora's box for me. So I think you've covered so many parts of what I wanted to ask you about. Uh. So this is my question. It's my final question for you. I'm saving the hardest for last. And everyone has a version or interpretation of you. Your family, your friends, your fans, but you know yourself best. Who do you think you are? Who do I think I am? When I'm home, I'm seven of eight. Okay? I'm the seventh child of eight children. When I come home, my brothers and sisters, you know, they ain't caught up in who I, what I do for a living. I'm seven of eight when I'm at home. And when I go to New York, then I'm with, I'm part of the, the jazz family. I'm just one of many Branches on the tree. And I just hope that I'm a worthy one. And I just hope that, that you know, what I do, that I become one of the pillars that, uh, that hold it up. So when, when I talk about the shoulders, or, or, or all of the people's shoulders on which I stand, I want people after me to think that, they're standing on even a little bit on my shoulders, that I have contributed enough, that I'm important enough, or whatever I've contributed is important enough that they consider me 
that because that is what's more important than any. I don't do this to be famous or to be rich. We all want to do well. We all would like to, you know, have wealth and, you know, be able to do what we want when we want. And pretty much I can because, you know, uh, I've lived my life a certain way to afford myself certain things. But it's funny you should ask that, too, because I'm a shepherd of sorts. I was having this conversation with my with the minister at my church yesterday, and I look up and I see, you know, I'm in this vineyard, and I'm a shepherd, and I got these, uh, you know, these people that, I, that I'm shepherding, you know, in jazz, so to speak. I said, but, you know, oftentimes I think I want a bigger vineyard. I want some more sheep. I'm ready to bust out a little bit more, you know. But doesn't make where I am any less important, you know, because I remember, a, a, you know, I didn't come out of the church like a lot of singers. They think, you know, every African-American singer came out of church. I didn't, you know. I raised uh, Episcopalian. I didn't sing in the Episcopalian choir or all of that. I just liked music and liked to sing since I was small. And so, <laughs> but um, I remember joining a Baptist church one day and um I sung with them for a little while and when but I was also, you know, working with my little organ group around town. And uh, they were very strict about their choir members not singing in the devil's workshops, quote unquote. And I quit the choir because I said, I'm not gonna stop singing jazz or be in this Baptist choir. I said, because you know, I feel like the creator puts his angels everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? In the vanguard, you know, in the hole in the wall on the corner. At the black cat where I used to sing where the wall didn't even go all the way down to meet the floor. And when it would rain, the puddle would form at a certain part of the club on rainy days. You just have to walk around it. I always wonder why they never fixed that. But, hey, you know, you get used to these things. (laughs) You do. I love that answer. I love how you opened up. Thank you for talking about Tad the important work you do for jazz and thank you for being a beacon i appreciate it and i thank you this is a team effort you know what i mean i'm not here by myself i'm here i depend on radio i love radio i recognize the challenges that radio is going through i've seen it happening over the years like you've seen it happening with jazz and jazz artists but we're all survivors we're all long distance runners we're not going nowhere Thanks for listening and tuning in to another Neon Jazz interview, where we give you a bit of insight into the finest players in Cleveland, Brooklyn, Kansas City, and spots all over the world, giving fans all that jazz. And thanks to Vanessa for her wisdom, her time, and all that music. If you want to hear more interviews, go to Famous Interviews with Joe Domino on the iTunes Store. Visit Neon Jazz at YouTube.com. And for everything Neon Jazz, go to the neonjazz.blogspot.com. Until next time, enjoy the jazz, my friends. Across the hall, can you believe it? In his kitchenette, across the hall, Mama too. In his kitchenette, across the hall. Neon Jazz.